Noah, the holidays are here. I'm feeling the energy and the revelry. And, um, you know, it, it makes you kind of think of like a gift that the Sixers could provide us with. And I, I'm, I'm just, I just want everybody to be healthy, man. It's just, you know, you go through a long 82 game season, you're not going to get, you know, everything you want from the players, particularly on the injury front. But, you know, once Tyrese Maxey comes back, I really feel like this team can hit their stride and build on all of the adversity they've been able to overcome. So I, I just really want them, the gift they could give me would be the health. I mean, I guess they don't really have a choice about that. But what about you? What do you think? I like that. Yeah, I recall saying something, I think, similar last year, which speaks to how often injuries have been <laughs> problematic for the Sixers. I think for me, just I wouldn't mind a little more quote unquote normal basketball, uh, just games in which there are not very strange twists and turns and there aren't, you know, six turnovers in the final two minutes and uh, that kind of thing, you know, as someone who covers the team, I don't mind it, but whatever happens, um, you know, it is what it is, but yeah, I think I personally don't mind, you know, weirdness in my sports, my art, my life. But for the Sixers, if it were just a little less frequent, um, you know, post holidays, you know, that would that would work out just fine for me. You know, them, you know, cruising to a win like they did against the Kings. Uh, nothing, nothing wrong with that from where I am. Sitting. Ready to build career skills in 2023? Apply to Wilmington University today. Get started by January 9th. Learn more and apply at wilmu.edu. Upskill, reskill, or start fresh in 2023 with a degree or certificate from Wilmington University. Wilmu works for you. Apply today to start January 9th. Yeah, baby. It is the Sixers Talk Podcast. So glad you could join us. We're brought to you by Wilmington University, Wilmu Works, Danny Pommels, and Noah Levick. Uh, we're here in our home studio, so no Rivers Casino today. We'll be back there next week on Tuesday, so be sure to pop up on us. Uh, check us out uh, in person, if you will. Um, ben Barry, our producer extraordinaire in the cut. And uh, it, it's pleasant to talk about some Sixers uh, continuity some wins, uh, three in a row for this squad, um, nine uh, out of 10 at home for this team. So it's just exciting that, you know, I, I try to lead with the positive because they're, you know, we, we get that negadelphia, you know, uh, stigma attached to us sometimes, Noah. So I try to lead with the positive. So, of course, we got in bleed, in bleed, in bead. It, it, he's making other teams bleed. How about that? Uh, we, we got Embiid as the Eastern Conference Player of the Week. Uh, some incredible numbers. Of course, the 53-burger against the Charlotte Hornets on Sunday. And really, no, I, I'm, I'm encouraged and feeling good about the team because these last two performances against Charlotte and the Kings, part of this three-game winning streak, was exactly what I wanted to see from them after that debacle at the end of the Lakers game where they squeaked it out in overtime thanks to an Anthony Davis missed free throw uh, that would have probably given the Lakers a win there with uh, just a few seconds to go. So I, I was just happy to see them come out and play strong basketball and and discover some things and continue to to grow as a team. Um, last night in particular, man, um, a few uh, notable performances, but uh, I, I read that James Harden's uh, 20 or more points and 15 or more assists was his third time accomplishing that. And now he's third to only uh, Allen Iverson, who has seven of those, and Wilt Chamberlain, who has six of those. So, I mean, the team continues to perform and their stars continue to do well when the team is doing well. So that's exactly what you want to see. But what's been your take over these last uh, three games, particularly starting with that Friday game, which was frustrating with the Lakers and then, you know, them popping out and beating the Hornets and um, the Kings as they should? Right. I think the positivity makes a ton of sense, but if we're focusing exclusively on the Lakers game, uh, there's quite a bit of negative <laughs> must be acknowledged. It's some time has passed, so it's like some, yeah. you know, time no, and, and these, a bit. these yeah. past few games, I think you 
nailed it in that they did exactly what they should have against two defenses that are not exactly formidable, but hey, you got to play the team that is on your schedule and 81st half points last night. I mean, that's Ooh. tough to do against any NBA opponent. And I think Joel Embiid uh, continues to be excellent at setting a very terrifying tone for the teams that the Sixers are facing at 16 in the first quarter. And you felt a little sorry, as you often do, for the opposing big men. Sabonis, uh, all-star level player, picks up two quick fouls. Uh, Nemius Keda, you look up and he's got three. And just Joel Embiid sometimes seems to have the ability to take like 40 free throws in a game if he wants. Uh, but certainly gave the Sixers the start that they were hoping for. And I think from both him and James Harden, you saw a real desire to move the ball and to get players like P.J. Tucker and Matisse Thibel open jump shots. And then, of course, the Sixers' pace as a team was actually superior to that of the you know, famously speedy Kings. What? Uh, the Sixers' yeah. pace was better than another it team? What? Quite a bit. Yeah, you look up and it is uh, 15 to 2 in fast break points at one point in favor of the Sixers. And sure, some of that's luck with the Kings missing open three point shots and just generally being woeful with their jump shooting. And De'Aaron Fox coming off a two game absence with right foot soreness. But the Sixers, I think, were diligent about transition defense. They knew that was especially important against Sacramento. And then. For them, James Harden was doing his thing with these head-to-head passes. And just as a team, the Sixers were turning defense into offense really well. And Harden actually was a big part of that in both ways. He had five steals in the first half of this game, 10 assists, 17 points, and finishes it with a buzzer-beating three that moves him past another Sixers great. If we're talking about some of those historical numbers, he's now gone beyond Charles Barkley on the all-time scoring list into 27th. And Allen Iverson is next up. So uh, some cool little accomplishments there from James Harden, who definitely was central to maybe the most impressive half the Sixers have played this season, albeit against an opponent that, again, is not elite defensively. But I don't think that should detract too much from everyone on the Sixers basically just contributing to something that is really rare, scoring 80 points in the first half of an NBA game. And there were glimpses of Harden that, ooh, he kind of looked like Houston Harden for a little bit in that first half, just uh, with the way he was handling the ball, the step back shots. It just looked like some of, he just really had it going on. And and some of the rhythm that he was in, it was kind of like, I, there was no one out there that could stop him. And, yeah, the Sixers did benefit from catch, catching De'Aaron Fox, as we talked about uh, before the podcast started. Well, he was a little rusty. Tobias Harris, they'll give him credit, uh, really played great defense on De'Aaron Fox. But uh, the Sixers team as a whole, you know, without Tyrese Maxey getting the good pace up and down, Doc Rivers talked about it, you know, in the post game press conference. And it's just uh, a good – omen for this team as they continue to grow and build and and they've been hampered by injuries and you know we see uh George Niang back the Anthony Melton out on the floor you know it's it just a, a little you know contrast with who's out there who's not and who's healthy but we saw the them playing great collective basketball which is is what's going to have to happen it, it can't just be the stars all the time it's going to have to be some of these role players stepping up and Tobias Harris, the ultimate role player for this team because he accepts whatever role that he's given and tries to thrive in that. Um, I was excited just to see them, like I said, bounce back from that Lakers game where that that just shouldn't have happened and all the things you hate about um, the mistakes and, you know, things like that late in the game and turnovers and all that. It just all reared its ugly head, but they bounced back showed that they could win against teams that they should. I thought it would be closer last night, honestly, between the Kings and the Sixers. But um, you, you mentioned it before we talked, the start of the podcast as well. It just turned into you know, one of those games 
like we had seen in the past between the Kings and the Sixers, uh, although the Kings are a lot better than they have been. Um, I'm curious if you feel like the Sixers have um, the tools to be better defensively and control the boards against teams that do that well also. So it's like, I, you know, you see Matisse Thibault and P.J. Tucker out there, Tobias Harris stepping up defensively. The rebounding sometimes can be hit or miss. Do you feel like that they're improving in those two specific areas and building on that? I, I thought the defense in the first half last night was legitimately good. Obviously, it dropped a couple of levels in the second. I didn't think the defense or the rebounding was was that great across the board in the Hornets game. I thought they won that game mostly because Joel Embiid touching the ball meant extremely efficient offense. But defensive rebounding does continue to be, I think, a valid concern. In the first like 14, sorry, th- 13 minutes in this game, uh, the Sixers conceded 14 second chance points. That was basically yeah. the main form of offense for the Kings. Miss a shot, grab the rebound. So some of that is fixable for sure, just being a little more attentive to getting a body on your man, uh, but clearly just as a team that continues to be a problem uh, that the Sixers really need to focus on fixing. Uh, Yeah, I think defensively, if you're looking for positivity, last night is a reminder that Tobias Harris has legitimately improved and increased his versatility over the past few years. I thought Matisse Thibel had a fun quote saying Harris continues to surprise him and he's noticed more and more that he's getting down in a deep defensive stance and uh, showing that intensity and that commitment that wasn't at the same level a couple of years ago. Uh, But I think Harris also, just the reps that he was able to get last year when the Sixers were trying to figure out how do we compensate for Ben Simmons not being on our team anymore. Tobias Harris guarded a ton of positions. Uh, I think Darius Garland is a classic example, how he stepped up and did well in the second half of the game against Garland and Cleveland. Of course, uh, had some success in the playoffs against Pascal Siakam. Uh, even going back a couple of years, did really well as a switch defender on Trey Young. So sure, Harris's, I think, obvious asset defensively is that he's super sturdy uh, and that he's just, you know, a veteran forward who's kind of do a solid, solid job for you. But I think now you also have to consider him someone who can step up in a difficult situation where DeAnthony Melton is scratched somewhat late, Daniel House is not available, and Matisse Thibault gets two fouls in 37 seconds. Okay, let's see if Tobias Harris can do the job, and I think now you're more confident uh, in that scenario than you would have been a couple of years ago. So the Sixers' defense wants to switch a lot when James Harden is on the court, and Tobias Harris has always been a big reason why that's viable, and the Sixers do have the capability of finishing this season as potentially, you know, a top three, top five defensive team. Uh, He is a big part of that who often flies under the radar, but then you get these little spots where he's more in the spotlight. And honestly, more often than not this year, he's been a positive uh, when the Sixers have asked him to fill a larger role. That defense will get tested on Friday when it's the Golden State Warriors here in South Philly on the six or seven game homestand. Uh, But before we get to that, we want to let you know if you are injured for over 70 years, Lundy Law has been the number one personal injury law firm in Pennsylvania, New Jersey and Delaware. Their services are exemplary. Their results are exceptional. Call 1-800-LUNDY-LAW to get the money you deserve. Um, Last night uh, in South Philly, it was a bit of a different buzz in the arena because um meek mill michael rubens reform alliance uh which is a program that gives opportunities and um shows love and adoration to families and specifically kids 
that have been affected by parents that have been incarcerated or family members that have been incarcerated. So uh, they had a blowout, you know, incredible day set up for these kids where they started at the Novacare Complex, met Jalen Hurts, some of the Eagles, ran drills, Howie Roseman, the whole kit and caboodle for them over there. And then they came to the arena and had to, got to have a mock press conference with Doc Rivers. And they came out and rang the bell and just bumping into a few of them at, around the arena and talking to them. I mean, you, you know, it, it's like you can glean from them everything that is exciting about our job and being around this atmosphere. You know, they get to enjoy it for one night. And sometimes it is a job. So we may, may take it for granted uh, sometimes, but just being around those kids, I'm sure you may have bumped into some of them or, just seeing you know them come out and sit courtside and, and enjoy the game, um, sitting next to kind of the who's who that's at the Sixers game. I'm sure you also absorb some of that energy from them. So it just it was just really cool to see them enjoy you know what what it what it means just to be a part of a game day or to be you know at the, the Eagles complex and just you know we sometimes forget it is a game and it. it it is a job for many of the players and for us to cover them, but uh, there is a uh, appreciation that we should always have for being able to do this for a living. I think I, I really picked that up from them, just talking with them and, and bumping into them in the hallways and whatnot. Yeah, that, that's a great observation. Um, yeah, I remember last year it, it was fun uh, watching Meek and um, various various other celebrities. He is, I think, would tell you not not the best athlete in the world, but he enjoys <laughs> it, and uh, he. I was going to leave that alone. I was going to leave for no, no, no. He makes, I think, you know, more important than that is he he makes a commitment to this legitimately being a super meaningful thing for these kids, and uh, obviously him and Michael Rubin are uh, quite committed to to this cause and highlighting uh, injustices, you know, in the American criminal justice system. Uh, with with parole and um, that how that system works. So uh, yeah, and that, that it definitely puts things in perspective for real. It's it is it is one of those one of those deals. And uh, yeah, there were, there was a lot of youthful energy at, at the Wells Fargo Center. And honestly, the the Sixers played one of the more, their more youthful feeling games. They were uh, right. getting out in the open court and having a good time. So I think that was also fitting that they put that sort of performance on for a slightly younger crowd than usual. You um, mentioned the athleticism and I had a chance to interview uh, Meek and Michael Rubin before the game to just talk about the opportunity they're providing and why this was important to them. And I asked Meek like, okay, like you and Michael Rubin, we've seen you guys be competitive a lot. Like who's winning in the game on one-on-one? And he scoffed and it was like, bro, I'm from the streets. like. I'm never letting this guy beat me in a game on one on one. And we've seen, you know, them do all types of stuff. And he was like, he may have me said he may have me in tennis because he grew up playing that. But give me a couple of years. I'll be there with him. But, um, you know, that the Novacare complex, he, Ruben and Meek are, you know, running pass routes and Howie Roseman's throwing them the football. and The kids are there taking it all in. It's just like something you can't replicate, uh, particularly here when the Eagles are so good and Jalen Hurts is a possible MVP candidate and they're right there, you know, asking questions, being, you know, elbow to elbow with them. So I felt like that was worth mentioning because it did give a certain energy to the arena. Most definitely. Yeah. I, I think it's definitely cool and uh, smart that the Eagles were incorporated in the day this year. Uh, I know, the Patriots have, have hosted the Reformer Lions before. And I was thinking, hmm, maybe, um, you know, the Great bird point. be part of this experience. And, yeah, I think the uh, multi-sport day, I'm sure, was was a lot of fun for, for those kids. And uh, the Eagles are, if we're being honest, uh, the hot ticket in town these days. So yeah. uh, I think it's cool that, you know, they were able to um, be a big part of this as well. Um, someone asked me yesterday, Noah, how far I thought the Sixers could go this season. And I kind of hate, you know, you know, we are approaching Christmas and the common concept um, thought is that 
uh, you know, the NBA season begins, doesn't begin until Christmas. And the Sixers play the Knicks on Christmas. And that'll be fun to watch, uh, particularly while we're, you know, those who, who enjoy the holiday or opening presents and whatnot. It's always something cool to look forward to. Um, and I hate, and I, I hate, like I said, to project that far out because I'm definitely one of those people who feels like, well, I, I might have thought that way in the past, but I've changed my way of thinking that it's really the journey and not necessarily the destination, which I've, I've said before, but um, I kind of get frustrated sometimes by um, how star heavy they can be at certain times. And I think that sometimes, you know, yeah, you need the Kawhi Leonard's and Jason Tatum's and Luka Doncic's of the world to win in the playoffs. But I really think that, you know, this is a good time. And I think they've benefited from having these opportunities where the other players on the team can be built up. So um, while I didn't quite answer that person's question, I continue to feel positive about the way that they bounced back from some of this adversity. And while we're not getting Shake Milton at the clip that he was when uh, Harden and Maxi were out and well, De'Anthony Melton continued to, to play great. George Niang missed time, and he comes back and continues to hit threes off the bench. Tobias Harris hasn't missed a beat. So I think I am encouraged at this point of the season by the way they've responded as everyone's getting healthy and what they've been able to accomplish while, you know, MB was out for a bit hard and maxi. Um, guys were missing time. I, I, I still feel that they have what it takes to be one of those upper echelon teams. And these last three games have showed me that it, it can be really good when it's really good. So hopefully they can continue more of this. Yeah, and, and it's always made sense. And we saw it last year, just Joel Embiid and James Harden on the court together. Every reason that should be an elite offense uh, and the Sixers, while Harden was out, had the NBA's best defense. So you find some way to lend those two things or at least come close to doing so. And that is a team capable of contending for an NBA title. But the Sixers overall have not looked like one. Uh, I think there have been flashes. And, of course, the hope is to get some more consistency and the expectation is that will happen uh, as the team becomes healthier. And I think, yeah, everyone will, of course, will be watching closely once Tyrese Maxey is back in this mix. Uh, and the team has, you know, it's expected third highest usage sort of guy in this, uh, you know, on, the, on this team. But, uh, yeah, positive, positive start to this homestand. And I think there's no reason the Sixers can't come out of this, you know, six and one or, or something along those lines. Yeah. You uh, wanted was, to say seven and oh, but you, you said, let me, let me scale it back a little that's bit. Also not impo- <laughs> that's not, not, not impossible. I won't count right. them out. Right. Hard to do, but um, I think, yeah, we certainly see much of the potential that we knew this team had coming a little bit more to fruition here. Albeit again, against some opponents that, are lesser tests than the Bucks and the Celtics of the world, who, of course, loom large when we think about what the Sixers are capable of in the NBA playoffs. Um, but, yeah, they needed to start this homestand really well. I think 12-12 and 12 and coming off that Houston loss in double OT, things were maybe not at an all-time low this season, but – there was just a sense of needing to turn it around and credit to the stars, specifically Joel Embiid, for ensuring that has happened. And Golden State this year has really struggled terribly on the road, so the Sixers hope that continues. And it's not at all impossible that they come out of this with a four-game winning streak and being able to say they beat the defending champs and uh, continuing to feel good about stylistically how they want to play and how they want to mesh uh, that pace that needs to be an aspect of their game with the Harden and Embiid ISO stuff that also should be a part of their game because it is so efficient. Uh, So trending in a good direction, but it's just three games and 
the hope here is that three games carries over into a six and one, or maybe even a seven zero homestand. You mentioned the Harden and B ISO stuff, and I had a couple points about Harden, but we'll start with that. And it's always interesting to uh, pick up on the wrinkles that they're adding to offense and. Doc Rivers in the post game talked about Harden posting up more and then him and Embiid running pick and roll out of that. Um, did you pick up on any of that or how they were using Harden in, in the paint to kind of set up that pick and roll? Yeah, not something they were featuring a ton. I think it happened three times, but it is intriguing and significant because James Harden post ups is not something we really tend to see from him, at least in previous years. And he is a very physically strong guy who has excellent court vision. So it makes sense that him in the post with shooters stationed around him should be threatening. Uh, so yeah, Doc Rivers even said, like, that's something we feel has promise late in games. And I know our last podcast, we were saying the Sixers need to have more variety with their down-the-stretch offense, and it would be helpful for them to mix it up a little. I think this is a nice option to at least explore uh, in that general area. But we did see the Sixers under Brett Brown you know, run this snug pick and roll with Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid. And I think the positive of it offensively is the defense has zero margin for error. Like, if you don't if there's any confusion or you don't take the right angle with how you're guarding it, then you're going to pay. One of those two guys is going to draw a free throw or he's going to get into the paint and score a layup or he's going to kick it out to an open teammate. So, of course, there's not much space to operate. And right. late in games, that's going to be super physical and defenses are probably going to get away with a lot of contact and – will be very determined not to allow Joel Embiid to catch the ball in that setting. But, hey, yeah, makes sense to try something like that out. And last night, uh, the results were good because Harden does draw a ton of attention. And George Niang, though he's not the guy you should ever leave open, uh, did get a couple of nice three-point looks off of that James Harden post-up. So. Definitely something to monitor moving forward. I think any time the Sixers can add a little something else that the defense has to be wary of, that just enhances the danger of a team that has really strong offensive personnel with its stars. Hey, we want to share something for you. And uh, if you um, – are aware uh, opioid addiction is a national public health crisis. The Someone You Know podcast from the Independence Blue Cross Foundation offers inspiring stories that challenge stigma, offer hope, and humanizes the disease of addiction. Download the new season three of the Someone You Know podcast. And um, as we move on, Noah, I uh, wanted to make a second hardened point because we know he's missed, you know, at least a month of time with this foot injury. But when he came back to the lineup, it was as if he hadn't missed any time because the minutes he has played have been significant, uh, hovering around 38 minutes a game, even with you know him working back from the foot injury. Uh, did that surprise you? Did you feel like that was um, something that uh, Doc Rivers should second guess? Like, why, why do you think they put him out there uh, with – seemingly no restrictions on amount of playing time so quickly after, you know, an older player and older in basketball terms, uh, you know, is working back from an injury, bringing them along a little slower might have, you know, seemed seemingly been a smarter move. But what, what did you make of that? Yeah, that, that's not good. That's not smart. I, I don't really <laughs> well, have well, much. Well, where are we at with that? Like, well, how can you? Yeah, how, it's, like, I mean, I think it's, the coach wants to win a game and, Sixers, you know, right after Harden got back, played multiple close games and two games in a row that went to overtime. So yeah. I guess you grade it on a little of a sliding scale because there's the extra five minutes, but no, shouldn't, shouldn't have been happening. What wasn't really excusable. It's just so, so important that 
James Harden stays healthy. We see he is what makes the Sixers offense capable of reaching that next level. And he is 33 years old and, and coming off a significant injury. Just n- not good from Doc Rivers in, in my mind. And I think the Sixers are at least thus far fortunate that, you know, it hasn't resulted in any setbacks for James Harden, but they've got to curb those minutes. And I think as I, I said, maybe on our last podcast, Doc Rivers, I think, knows that he has the tendency to overdo it and lose sight of the big picture when games are close. Mm. And there was that stretch last year where Harden had played around 39 minutes per game after getting a load management day and asked him about it. And he said, yeah, that's that's too many. We've got to cut that back. So yet again, we're in a position where I think he has to fight against his instincts a little bit. And in some close games... Just, okay, let's make sure instead of 39 minutes, it's 35, and Shake Milton gets more of a run as the primary ball handler, and, and we give our bench a little more responsibility. So for me, like if you're looking for areas to criticize with Doc Rivers, I think some of them are open for debate and you know certainly invite controversy and discussion. For me, this is just not, not good. Can't, can't be doing that. Uh, and it needs to go down to those minutes for James Harden. When Harden was asked about it, he kind of seemed to take the "it is what it is" approach to, you know, how it yeah, might be affecting I mean, his foot. Just his tone and his body language. Not like he's furious about it, but no, I don't right. think he's thrilled that that's been happening. And I think also an aspect of that is certainly he and the team were frustrated that. They lost the Houston game, went to double overtime, and then also, of course, that they blew the late lead against the Lakers, which allowed five extra minutes of game time there. But this was not what he was expecting. You know, the multiple times he's been asked about it, it's clear he did not think the minutes would be soaring this high right away for him. Uh, Of course, he's handled it well after the Houston game. Seems to have not taken very long to rediscover his rhythm and be racking up 15, 16 assists tonight. So at least performance wise, it hasn't had any negative sort of impact, but there are just bigger things that you have to be aware of here than winning regular season games in in my eyes. So at least the Sixers closed this one out decisively and that allowed five or six minutes on the bench for the stars at the end of the game. But look, that won't happen every night. That's obviously ideal, but uh, in the situations where it is close down the stretch, I don't think the norm should be 40 minutes for James Harden. Uh, I think just overall in the regular season, and then I think especially coming off a month on the sidelines with a serious injury. So, yeah, we don't want to be Negadelphia here. We want to uh, certainly highlight the fact that the Sixers are playing good basketball, have a three game winning streak, but. Man, that is that's just poor management of one of your stars thus far. But again, um, I think somewhat subjected to you know change if, if the Sixers are able to alter their approach a little here and Doc Rivers uh, showcases a little more prudence with James Harden's minutes. But yeah, when it's he- just it's just a really bad deal. It's a really bad thing if this this guy suffers another injury and you're increasing the chances that happens when you manage him like this and and you're not seeing any problems with with playing him so many minutes. Yeah, winning is the ultimate deodorant, right? So, you know, they, they score over 120 points in back-to-back games, shoot over 50% from the floor, over 45% from three. So, like, all is well. That ends well, so to speak. But, um, yeah, well said, Noah. Uh, it, it's tough to understand the thinking. But, like you said, the back-to-back overtime games contributed to that. But it's just um, – confusing puzzling the way um you know the minutes were parsed out but um we'll be here uh with you every step of the way of course here on the sixers talk podcast we will rejoin you on tuesday from rivers casino come out and check us out uh say hi uh happy holidays to everyone out there and uh for noah levick and ben barry i'm danny pommels we're brought to you by wilmington university wilm works and we'll see you next time